Anime Recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain a drama mystery sci-fi anime called Brynhildr in the Darkness. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. When Ryota Murakami was young, he had a friend named Kuroneko, who believed in aliens. They used to watch the sky together, searching for any signs of alien life. As Ryota was skeptical, Kuroneko insisted that she had already met one of them and even knew where it was. She then led him to the alien's supposed location. But while crossing a dam, they accidentally fell into it together. In a stroke of miracle, Ryota survived. And when he got out of the hospital, he was informed that Kuroneko died. Since then, Ryota's kept his friend in his mind. He can't forget her, and he even remembers that she had this particular pattern of three moles on her armpit. It also became his goal to work for NASA and prove the existence of aliens so he can make his beloved friend's dreams come true in her steed. Ten years later, and Ryota is taken aback when he sees the transfer student who looks exactly like his late friend. Even her name, Kuroha Neko, is very similar to hers. Since he's fully convinced that she's Kuro Neko, he thoughtlessly asks Neko to show him her armpit in front of everyone, causing him to get slapped. PE class comes, and Ryota still can't keep his eyes off the new transfer student. They are supposed to have a swimming lesson, but Neko exempted herself because she can't swim. The rest of the girls are in the pool when the filter cover on the poolside loosens, sucking one of the girls' legs into the filter. Horrifically, one of the girls failed to get her head above the pool, and strangely enough, Neko knew that this would happen. While everyone's panicking and struggling to help the poor girl, Neko predicts that two students are going to die that day. Day. She stares at the ground, which breaks open, letting the girl's leg come loose. Finally, she's saved. It has been a long day for Ryota, so after class, he goes straight to the old observatory to look at the stars. Though it's been 10 years, he still can't accept that Kuroneko's gone. At this point, he wishes that he could just forget about her. Suddenly, the lights switch on, and to his surprise, Neko comes in. When she asks about the observatory, he explains that after his upperclassmen graduated, he's become the only member of the astronomy club. And if he doesn't get more members to join, the club will be dissolved. Ryota then catches him in the middle of talking and flustered, he apologizes for how he behaved this morning and mentions that she just looks so much like his childhood friend, whose death he blames himself for. Neko accepts the apology but makes it clear that she's not the friend he's talking about. Cutting to the chase, Neko reveals that two students should have died today at school, the girl who almost drowned and him. Ryota is naturally taken aback by this, but she ignores his disbelief and warns him that he mustn't miss the last bus going home. If he does, he will die. Though Ryota doesn't believe her at all, he eventually relents and assures her that he won't miss the bus. Satisfied, Neko's about to take her leave when she catches sight of a constellation poster. She asks how many constellations there are, and while Ryota's explaining, he discovers that she doesn't know the multiplication table. This leaves him wondering how someone can enter high school without even knowing this basic form of math. Embarrassed by this, Neko defends herself by saying she has other things going for her, such as being physically stronger than him. Ryota finds it hard to believe her because she looks fragile. To prove her claim, she accepts his challenge to arm wrestle. She wins without even trying, proving that she is indeed stronger. Now that he knows she's not lying about her strength, Ryota finds himself believing in the girl's predictions. He then asks how he could lose to such a squishy girl like her, and Neko asserts that he's probably a wimp. Suddenly, a beeping sound can be heard from Neko's belongings. She pulls out the source of the beeping, which is an amateur radio, and contacts someone with it. They talk about how the forecasts changed, but now it's even worse. Neko then asks if it won't matter whether Ryota gets on the bus or not. Should she just let him die? Ryota is horrified to hear this, but Neko just casually tells whoever she's speaking with that she'll let him know. With that, she turns to him, saying that it's fine if he misses the bus, but he should stay there in the observatory. As Neko leaves, she reminds Ryota that she warned him, so he better believe her. This reminds the stunned boy of Kuroneko, who had told him to believe her too. With Neko parting from the observatory, she thinks that she had saved two lives. Not like the time she was involved in a vehicular accident, one that killed a friend. That person told her that she was the one who can save the world from ruin. Neko didn't know what she meant at the time, but with her ability, she hopes to save the lives of the people around her. Meanwhile, Ryota tests Neko's prediction. He doesn't get on the bus, but he doesn't stay in the observatory either. Though it's raining hard, he walks his way back home. Suddenly, a landslide occurs and almost buries him alive. The only thing Ryota can think about in that very moment is how Neko was right. But just as a large rock is about to fall on him, Neko arrives and breaks it in half with her bare hands. With the oddities mounting one after another, Ryota starts demanding Neko to reveal her identity. She admits to being a witch, but he doesn't believe her because magic has never been scientifically proven to be real. To prove her point, she shows him the button implanted on the back of her neck, which is the source of her so-called magic. He grasps it, but contrary to Neko's belief, it isn't magic, it's advanced technology. She tells him that she's trying to hide her ability since she ran away from the lab, but Ryota drowns out her explanations. Deep in his heart, there's still a part of them that hopes, wishes, that Kuroha Neko is Kuro Neko. While a frazzled Ryota is continuing to ponder Neko's existence, she emphasizes that nobody can know that she's a witch, or else she'll get killed. She warns him to stay away from her before walking away, and when he tries to call her back, she firmly asserts that she is not her childhood friend. But as Neko parts from him, with the rain streaming down her face, 
her tears seemed to mix with them too. Because of Kuroneko's obsession with aliens, she never had the chance to see the ocean. This very fact keeps haunting Ryota in his dreams. Come next morning, he's already eager to talk to Neko, learn more about her, and he's sure that he can do this since they're in the same class. Neko, however, is absent that day, so his teacher asks him to deliver the transfer form and field trip guide to her address. Ryota's confused to learn that her address is located past the observatory since he's sure that there aren't any houses there. As he's walking to the observatory, a convoy of self-defense force armored vehicles pass by, sparking his curiosity. Unbeknownst to him, the vehicle is loaded with girls who look like Neko. They're either bound or have strange devices attached to them. Neko's address is a lookout point with an abandoned area nearby. Ryota figures that she has to lie about her exact address to stay under the researchers' noses. He then trespasses and soon catches the girl singing out of tune while hanging clothes. Upon realizing that he's there, Neko grows flustered and embarrassed, seeing as Ryota had discovered not just her location, but her horrid singing too. He doesn't comment on either, however, and instead, he hands over the forms to her. But to his shock, she tells him that there's no need for her to go back to school anymore since she already saved the people who were meant to die that day. Although she's curious about student life, Neko squashes these curiosities as she believes that she can survive without engaging in it. After all, she survived all those years learning nothing in the research lab where she was endlessly experimented on. While Ryota's trying to convince Neko to keep going to school, he suddenly hears a voice coming from inside the house. He insists on going inside, but she uses her power to make the ground burst beneath them as a warning, forcing him to leave. Just as the begrudging boy is about to jump over the gate, he realizes that he can't just leave her. Against his better judgment, Ryota rushes back to her and sneaks into the house, where he catches Neko having a conversation with someone he can't see from behind the wall. He listens in on their conversation, and to Ryota's sheer terror, he hears her saying that she can't be friends with him. If she does, he will die with her. When Neko leaves the room, Ryota sneaks in to see who she was talking to, and he's surprised to discover a well-made doll on the bed. He takes a closer look to check if it's alive, just in time for Neko's return. He starts panicking, but Neko simply dismisses his attempts at explaining himself. She doesn't even question why he's there, and instead, she reveals that the doll is alive, and her name is Kana. Kana was paralyzed after going through many experiments, but her fingers can move. She communicates by typing on a small keyboard, which then translates her typed words into an AI-generated voice. Kana proceeds to scold Ryota for sneaking in, and here, he discovers that she's the one who saved him from being crushed by the rock since she's the one giving the forecasts of possible accidents in the future. More regretful now, she also informs Neko that one of their friends, Kanade, who also escaped like them, was caught. Neko wants to rescue her, but there's not much they can do against that institution, especially since they don't even know where the lab is. Later on, Kana persuades Neko to go back to school, saying that it's the best she can do for them despite their short lives. The next day, Neko goes back to school, which only proves to be a struggle for her, seeing as she doesn't even know how to read. This leaves Ryota worried about her. Soon enough, Kana calls, informing her that a nearby lady in red is about to die. Without a second to waste, the pair rushes to the location Kana told them about and in their haste, a woman nearly hits them with her bike. By the time they've arrived at the place, a car has already rammed itself into a store. Neko is distraught, thinking that she was too late, but a bystander informs them that there were no casualties. This is when Ryota notices the same biking woman from earlier, and he realizes that she's the woman in red who was about to die. Since they nearly bumped into her, that altered her time of arrival there, ultimately changing her fate. He comforts the downcast Neko, saying that they saved her one way or another. Meanwhile, in the research laboratory, a girl is tied down, with people forcing her to reveal the location of the other escapees. And when she can't give them answers, they ruthlessly eject her by pressing a button on her nape. And just like that, her whole body starts melting away. Not knowing about the other subject's tragic death, things are on the lighter side with Neko and Kana, who are just worrying about what they'll eat next when Ryota suddenly arrives with some delicious food. This may be a simple gesture, but it's enough to drive the girls to tears from their sheer excitement. They can finally enjoy some well-cooked food instead of having whatever they manage to forage from the mountains. Bit by bit, maybe they can even feel a semblance of normalcy in their lives too. As for Yota, he can't help but feel like he wants to stay there with Neko forever. It's worth asking though, is it because of Neko herself, or is it because she looks like his childhood friend? Since it's getting late, Neko goes to see her newfound friend off. While they're talking about the field trip, blood starts gushing from her nose, surprising the both of them. Neko didn't go to class the next day, so Ryota rushes to their hideout to check up on them. He is terrified to find her lying on the floor just below Kana's bed, extremely weak and covered in blood. Neko asks Ryota to carry her to the kitchen and there, she takes a pill called Death Depressant. Apparently, witches need to take this pill every 30 hours to stay alive or their organs start melting and they will slowly die. The problem is they only have 10 pills to last both witches for 5 days. Ryota feels guilty when he realizes that she is saving up pills to last her until the field trip. While Neko is sleeping, Ryota asks Kana where he can get more pills. Unfortunately, she says there might be no other place to get them but the research lab. Seeing as they don't even know where the pills are, she and Neko have just accepted that there isn't much time left for either of them. Later on, Neko wakes up and finds Ryota just outside the house, cutting 
firewood. But what was supposed to be an idyllic moment takes a harrowing nosedive as the house starts catching fire. Neko had completely forgotten about the water she was boiling. Ryota immediately rescues Kana, while Neko uses her special abilities to put the fire out. But despite their best efforts, the pills have been burned, and Neko is devastated. Despite the girl's hopelessness, Ryota promises them that he will help them get more pills because he can identify the pharmaceutical lab that manufactured them. At this point, it ought to be clear that Ryota has a very strong memory. After all, it's the very thing that's been ceaselessly haunting him, hurting him. Memories don't just fade for Ryota, but thanks to this, he vividly remembers the label on the pill. Ryota brings Neko and Kana to the observatory. There, he looks up the lab's address and informs them that he still needs help to get past the security. For this, Neko calls the geeky witch Kazumi, who helped her enter the school. As expected, Kazumi wastes no time in demanding her payment in pills. And when a somber Neko says she doesn't have any pills to pay her with, Kazumi reminds her that she isn't a charity. But when she discovers that they'll be bursting into the lab, Kazumi grows amused and she agrees to help them in exchange for half the pills they steal. Hearing her ridiculous demands, Ryota suddenly speaks up, commenting on how greedy she is, which stuns Kazumi. Irate, she asks Neko if she involved an outsider in this before emphasizing that he will die for being caught in this messy entanglement. But this time, Ryota steals himself and stares death in the making straight in the face as he accepts the possibility. Without hesitation, he says that he's well aware of this, so the very pleased Kazumi agrees to their operation. But just as things are beginning to look up, Kana delivers another prediction. Neko will be killed during the operation. It turns out that a stronger witch named Saori is being used by the lab to ambush Neko. She can slice anything in half within six meters. Despite knowing this, Neko still insists on pursuing their plan as long as Kana can reassure her that Ryota will not die with her. As for Kazumi, she also has run out of pills now, and she's about to die, much like Neko and Kana. She doesn't tell anyone about this. When they arrive at the factory, Neko hands over a letter to Ryota and they split up. Kazumi successfully lifts the security, so Ryota can enter without a problem. He reads the letter while Neko faces Saori. The letter only fills him with worry as it details that Neko plans on acting as a decoy so he can steal as many pills as he can to save Kana and Kazumi. In his worry, Ryota can't help but risk it all and run back. When Ryota decides to go after Neko, Kana screams in horror because she sees both Ryota and Neko dying together. As Saori is slicing everything around to intimidate her opponent, she also tears up Neko's shirt, exposing her left chest. Ryota arrives and is surprised to notice the three moles on Neko's chest. This triggers another memory for him, and this time, it's about Kuro Neko telling him that for as long as she could remember, her moles keep moving on her body. Ryota can't stop his tears from falling as he now has definitive proof that his childhood friend Kuro Neko and Neko are the same person. With even more vigor and purpose now, he grabs a weapon while pondering why his beloved friend doesn't recall him at all. He then remembers Kana telling him that Neko loses important things whenever she uses her powers. And Ryota deduces that this could be linked to her memory loss. But in the end, it doesn't matter to him whether she remembers him or not because from now on, he's vowed to protect her with everything he has so nothing can tear them apart anymore. So they can see the ocean, the stars, aliens, everything, together, forever. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.